Happy New Year, sisters, and welcome to the first webinar of this new year. Our fall series was very successful and well received. Now we shall focus on our national projects, both mandatory and voluntary. I want to thank Grand Secretary Georgette, Grand Governor Zone One Kathy, and Executive Director Elena for setting up and coordinating our webinar. I want to thank past Grand President Evelyn Siadis for agreeing to be chairman of this project for the Daughters of Penelope. Today, our presentation is about Penelope House. So without further ado, I invite Grand Secretary Georgette to introduce our speaker. Happy New Year, sisters, and welcome. It is my honor to introduce to you Sister Tony Ann Kumanis Torrance, who is the Executive Director of Penelope, Penelope House. Tony Ann served as a United, in the United States Peace Corps in Kingston, Jamaica, where she helped set up social work department in the hospital for children. She worked as a medical social worker for nearly 15 years at Providence Hospital before coming to Penelope House in March of 2007. Tony Ann received her master's in social work at the University of Southern Mississippi and her undergraduate degree in sociology with social work emphasis at the University of Southern Mississippi, where she played varsity volleyball for four years and was a member of the Delta Delta sorority. Currently, Tony Ann is the executive director of Penelope House attends the Annunciation Greek Orthodox Church and is a member of the Junior League of, Mo of Mobile, the Daughters of Penelope, and the National Association of Social Workers. Tony Ann is a proud mother of two sons, ages 17 and 14. I can't believe they're 17 and 14, <laughs> Tony Ann. They were like three and four when we first met. <laughs> Unbelievable. We also have with us the founder, the visionary of Penelope House, Sister Dr. Catherine Kumanis, who will be joining us as panelists. Thank you, Tony Ann, for taking the time to present the Penelope House project to us, and I turn the program over to you. Well, thank you. That was a lovely introduction, and Happy New Year to everyone. Um, and this is really a, um, a neat kind of way of giving everyone an update on Penelope House, because normally at convention, I can only um, you know speak speak from there and and try to paint the picture of everything the best that I can. Um, but with, with me actually being at Penelope House and the administrative office, um, it's kind of more comfortable where I can uh, maybe bring some staff in to say hello to you and things like that, where you really can get hopefully a, a better feel and a better understanding of, of what all that we do at Penelope House. So um, in the uh, first slide is, um, is the picture of Dr. Catherine Kamanis, my mom, who, um, in the very beginning saw the need for a shelter in our community. So many have heard the, um, the story before, but it's a good one. So it's always worth repeating. Um, back in 1978, when the Thais chapter of the Daughters of Penelope started in Mobile, Alabama, um, they, um, they started the chapter because there actually was a, um, a district convention in Mobile and there wasn't a daughter's chapter. So I help was like, hey, we need a daughter's chapter. So it was formed. Um, in the spring of 78. And then um, by the fall, my mom was a social worker with the Department of Human Resources for the state of Alabama. And she, she saw from her staff that, that there was a need for women to go when they were victims of abuse. Um, and back in the 70s, domestic violence wasn't even a term. So um, mom had gone to the typical agencies, United Way, um, Catholic Social Services, the city of Mobile. She went to all the typical places, but it was no one's mission. It wasn't, they saw it their job to do something like that. So mom took the idea to the Daughters of Penelope and the Thais chapter with about $27 in their bank account voted unanimously to start a shelter um, for victims of domestic violence and their children. So um, immediately afterwards, they formed a board and then some of them went to the only, there was um, the only shelter in the whole Southeast region was in Florida and in, um, in Jacksonville, right, mom? Yeah. Yep. 
in Jacksonville. And they went there. It was three daughters and, and another lady from our community went there and learned from them how they were doing things. And then they came back to Mobile. And then in March 19, 1979, Penelope House opens its doors as the very first shelter for victims of domestic violence and their children in the state of Alabama and fifth in the nation. So the daughters have been behind the work of um, empowering women, keeping women safe, um, trying to educate that, that it's not acceptable, it's not, should never be tolerated in our communities. The daughters have been behind this from the very beginning. Um, so as we, um, as we have grown, um, it's become more and more important, not just to provide the services locally, but for all sisters to understand the impact of violence in their community and, and how each of us can make a difference. Next slide, please. Please. <laughs> and she's wearing a Penelope House mask there that, that we had and many daughters actually, sisters in the community um, and abroad actually purchased one. Um, what I wanted to do with this slide is kind of give you a glimpse of the shelter. Um, this is, um, we have, the way our shelter is built, it's almost, it has like a dorm feeling to you. Um, clients stay in individual rooms, but yet you have like a bucket that you go to the bathroom where you can take your showers and things like that. So when clients come to the shelter, um, they have to enter two um, gates and there's barbed wire on top and everything else. So when they come to our shelter, they know that they're safe. And many times the first thing that we hear is that's the best night of sleep I've ever had because they knew they were safe, that no one could get to them. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we provide not only the safe environment, but a comfortable environment. And um, our, our, our budget is over $2.25 million. So we have a large, um, budget that we manage and we also provide services 365 days a year. We never close. So every holiday we're open, um, we have staff that's on site 24 hours a day. So in the pictures that I'm, I'm showing you here is um, on the far right hand side is, is a shower room because in addition to um, challenges of finances, challenges of um, technology for the good and for the bad of others. Um, we also have to make sure that, that our quarters are safe and secure. And sometimes things happen just like they happen near in your own homes. Um, in October of 2019, we actually had um, a, a pipe burst in the bathroom. And of course it burst at midnight and so water was everywhere in the bathroom and then it seeped out into the hallway and it was a, a terrible mess. And by the time night staff, our overnight staff had realized that she got beach towels and tried to put down as much as she could. Um, she had called me and the shelter supervisor and we both got there at three in the morning and it was a total mess. It was awful, awful. And you know, we got the people serve pro to come in immediately to start cleaning and the fans in and everything else. But it turned out it was so bad. Um, we had to, all the clients that were in shelter, we had to move to a hotel. And my staff was working out of this hotel. We had a room that was based for staff and we had to manage that way, continuing services without a beat all the way until February of 2020. So the bathroom on the right hand side that you see here, the shower room is the brand new tile, the paint, um, the new shower stalls that we had. Everything was totally replaced. Thank God for insurance for that. And then the, the, all the clients rooms, drywall, everything had to be pulled out. And we basically got a remodel in the shelter, which was beautiful, but it was a very unfortunate way of how that came about. Um, you know, we shelter anywhere um, you know, in 2019, it was over 800 people that we sheltered, uh, women, adults, and children. So there's a lot of in and out. There's a, a very transient population with domestic violence because there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot may come to our shelter and they may relocate with family later in California or New York or wherever kind of thing. So 
it's a, a lot of wear and tear, but, but it was a wonderful thing that came out of that flood. But as soon as we got back into the shelter, it was end of February, the beginning of March, 2020. And all of you know what happened at that point. That's when the pandemic really hit. So we had just settled back into our remodeled shelter when the pandemic hit. So it went from one chaotic incident to another one. And what we're very fortunate, um, while things have changed, um, for example, when we shelter someone in the, in the, house, in the, in the shelter, um, if there were three single ladies, we may have, they may have stayed in one room together. And then they had their buckets where they could go to the shower room and all those kind of things. But as soon as the pandemic hit, um, the first thing that I did was I called Dr. Bert Eichold, who's in charge of the Mobile County Health Department, to ask him what specific protocols do we need to have in shelter since it's communal living. And he gave us um, very clear marching orders. And basically, he did tell us, how do you handle somebody who has the flu? And it's like, well, we isolate them in their room and then they only can use a certain bathroom and we bring their meals to them to eat in their room. Um, we don't let them, you know, do group. They don't participate with others in the dining room. They don't smoke with others on the patio. You know, they're isolated. And he's like, that's exactly how you need to treat everybody with the pandemic. And so when that happened, things really changed because now the three ladies who stayed in the room could no longer stay in the room together. Now they all became private rooms or one family unit. A mother with her three children could stay in a room. A single lady would stay in a room. A mother with a two-year-old would stay in a room. So they all became specific to families. And so that really changed the number of people that we could house as well. And that also changed with children not every, all the kids can go in the playroom at the same time. So we had to very, we had to be very organized with the case managers working with the, um, the clients and say, you know, if so-and-so wants them to go in the playroom, y'all can go first. And then after 30 minutes, when you come out, staff has to go in there, disinfect, clean everything. And then when that family leaves, then the next family could come in and enjoy the playroom. So there's a lot of the protocols that we've had in place for many, many years that we had to adapt um, to make sure that we kept everyone um, as safe, healthy-wise, medically-wise as possible. And so the, the picture on the far left, you can see um, there's three um, computer monitors and two printers. This was a project that we had completed in 2019, and we're so excited that that was uh, completed, it's called our IT room, because this allowed the children who couldn't go to school an opportunity to do all of their classwork, their homework, their Zoom classes, everything like that within this IT room. Um, many of the schools here provided the devices, um, the little Chromebooks or iPads or whatever for kids to be a part of the school system. And they even provided hotspots for them. So many could do their work in their room, but you can imagine being stuck in your room for school and you know that it would just get overwhelming. So this was a wonderful thing that we had in place that allowed them to continue their school and, and participate in you know all of the activities related to school. And then in, on the bottom picture that you see, um, uh, I have a housing, I have a 13. 310 housing in Mobile um, um, allowed us an opportunity to write a request for funding. And we requested funding to um, redo our dining room. So it wasn't um, dark and, and kind of an institutional feel to it. And um, with that money we received, that's brand new flooring, it's brand new um, wallboard, you know, it's LED lighting. I mean, everything is beautiful. And because with the pandemic, people were not eating inside of our dining room. It actually was a good time for us to do that renovation and not disrupt everyone's schedule and everything else. So the kind of the benefit of, of part of the COVID shutdown and everything else would have allowed us to do a lot of, um, of the renovations that, that we had always hoped to do, but we didn't have the money. And then now that we had the money from AHEPA, then we actually could do it. So like I said, it, it's I always think of, of a clown and you're juggling balls. That's constantly what we're doing. We're, we're adjusting to maybe what's happened in the community like the pandemic, but also adjusting to 
you know, making the lemonade out of the lemons with, with possible funding opportunities and things like that. We'll go next. So this is an example of, of, of some of our staff. Um, the, the two on the left-hand side are our case managers. So when anyone um, is in the community and we serve four counties, Mobile, Washington, Clark, and Choctaw counties, and those are counties that pretty much, if you're looking at the state of Alabama, those counties go up the Mississippi line. Um, and so if any one of those counties um, feels that they're in danger, they're scared, they're worried they may be hurt or their children will be hurt, they call our 24-hour crisis line. And again, it's answered by a person. And when they're cleared for shelter, they're given 24 hours to come in the shelter. Um, they have to come um, escorted by law enforcement. And, you know, if it's somebody who is in Choctaw County that, that the furthest part is four hours away, their sheriff will bring them to the county line where then the next sheriff will bring them to the next county line. And then when they get to Mobile County, our sheriff will pick them up and bring them to shelter. And that's to make sure they get to us safely and it's to make sure that they're not followed. So it protects our staff as well. So once they're here, um, the case managers will work with them in, in helping them develop their plan. You know, what is it that they, they hope to accomplish while they're here? Some of them have legal issues where they may wanna pursue protection from abuse orders, or they may want to um, look at custody issues or divorce issues or some may have you know, law enforcement where they need to sign warrants and things like that. So our case managers will work with them on those areas, but also work with them on goals moving forward, um, whether that be housing, job opportunities. Um, you know, many times perpetrators will destroy property. You know, all of us, if you can imagine what you have in your purse right now, a lot of times what perpetrators will do is take the victim's purse and will either burn it you know, we, we're on the bay, we're on, you know, on the, on the coast here, so they throw it in the bay. They do anything to destroy your ID because if you don't have your driver's license, your social security card, and things of that nature, you can't apply for a job. You can't apply for housing. You can't do these things. So they're all barriers for you to move forward where you may just give up and go back. So we do a lot of work with trying to get new birth certificates and, and new um, insurance cards, everything that they need, we help them rebuild so they can then make steps to move forward. Um, on the right hand side is one of our prevention educators. Um, you know, domestic violence is a learned behavior. Um, we all learn firsthand from our parents. And so if your parents at home have a violent history, if they used um, terrible words with each other, if they're physical, I mean, kids see it and they learn it. And so our prevention education goes into the schools, whether it's pre-K or seniors in high school and even college age kids to talk to them about everything from um, with little kids, um, who are the safe people that you can talk to, um, you know, whether it's a neighbor or a priest, an aunt or whoever, grandparent, um, all the way up to dating violence, to bullying, to healthy relationships. And so each year we see over 20,000 children. Well, as soon as the pandemic hit, that stopped. People, girl, you know, kids weren't in school. Um, we weren't able to reach children the way we normally do. And so what we had to do and what we did do is develop um, professional videos. So when the classes were on Zoom, they could have our prevention educators were stationed here like Gina at her desk. And then it's an interactive, just like we're doing here. They show parts of the video and then they could discuss it with our, our prevention educators leading the conversation. Um, they have counselors you know, that are available at the school, but that was our way of reaching and continuing our prevention education program. So we've had to, again, pivot, adjust um, because of, of, of COVID-19, but, but we've done a lot of things differently, but we've been allowed to, it's allowed us to continue our services and just think outside of the box and how we do it. Um, again, you know, just because the pandemic hit doesn't mean that, that things stopped or didn't continue. Um, you know, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and 
we just had to think of a way to do it differently. Normally we have a big um, fundraiser. We have um, a traveling domestic violence awareness display. The display is um, made up of arts and you know that clients could tell their story through the arts and so and staff as well. So what we did this year was we, um, we received a grant um, from a local um, all state insurance agent who um, allowed us to buy these wooden homes. And it was just a simple kit that you put together and the theme of peace on earth begins at home, which certainly all of us were kind of understanding a little more because so many of us were, were homebound during the pandemic, especially when it first was launched. So um, our clients that we were having shelter, our staff, and then um, Evelyn Seattis and, and other daughters um, got the kits, decorated them themselves. So we had them on display at, um, like Government Plaza, which is where all of our court and the mayor's offices and all that is. Uh, we had them on display there, but we encouraged people to um, have a virtual display. So people have done houses in New York and they did them all over the place where we could share them on the Penelope House website and social media, Instagram and things like that, where we were doing domestic violence awareness in a different way. And it was wonderful that, that people were very creative in, in how they decorated their houses um, you know, we had provided them to local businesses that, that we work with, and there were some very touching and very inspirational houses that people used to tell their stories, and it very, like I said, it's just very impactful um, and, and turned out to be a wonderful thing. And then in October, we also recognized law enforcement because, like I said, they play, we they are truly um, community partners that we rely on, whether it's to keep the victims safe at home or whether to arrest the perpetrators or whether just to, um, when they come bring clients to Penelope House, keeping us safe. And we gave them all um, those Penelope House hats, which again was a great thing that, that we thought through because normally we give them like a big tin of popcorn and all the law enforcement officers share. Well, we're not sharing food right now. So it, you know, with us giving individual gifts or tokens, they kind of worked well with the whole theme of, of, you know, all the COVID precautions we were following. And then as we went through to Christmas, you know, Christmas in the shelter is such a, a wonderful thing. Uh, domestic violence is so ugly and it really is heartbreaking, the stories and the situations that we see. But on the flip side, we see such generosity of people in the community who, who want to show they care, they want to make things better. We usually, all of our clients fill out a wish list and we have um, people from all over sponsor them. We had people um, like from Atlanta, um, John Busalis, many of y'all know him. He wanted to help, but you know he couldn't go shopping and he didn't want to send it here. So he sends money for, for, for us to go shopping for a family. So like I said, there's a different ways that people just stepped up and Christmas was amazing. Um, and again, we had to do it a little differently. We had to bring in a few different, more trees, Christmas trees than normal. So that way each family could go to a separate Christmas tree to get their presents as opposed to, you know, sections within the dining room where, where everyone are kind of together, but not clumped together. So that was some social distancing that we practiced during Christmas. Um, but this is a picture of our staff at um, Penelope's Closet. And um, so many uh, of the daughters you know, as a whole, as chapters or individual sisters send so much to our thrift store that we can sell to continue to raise income to support the shelter. But also that, you know, the thrift store, um, anytime any client needs anything or a child needs anything, we can get it for them for free or if someone's leaving the shelter and starting um, you know, their new home, if they need pots and pans or small appliances, whatever we have there at that time, they're welcome to have that for free. So I wanna stop for just a second. Um, I had told Elena that I was gonna have some surprise guests here and there. And um, Melanie Bankhead is our shelter supervisor. And she just um, walked in here and I was gonna let her say hello. And, and maybe, um, maybe just share with you Briefly, I talked to them a little bit about our changes in protocols and things like that, but maybe if you want to um, share a little bit about how the, the staff works together, the kitchen and, and, and things like that, I'm going to let her just come step right here. 
Okay. And this is Melanie Bankhead. Hey, y'all. And this is one of the advantages of, like I said, doing it here at my office is that you actually can meet some of our staff that I'm not able to bring with me every summer to a convention. Yes, but I'd love to come to a convention. <laughs> um, uh, so I've been here 23 years. I've been the shelter supervisor for 13. And, um, you know, it's been a wonderful experience being able to protect the victims from uh, violence and provide safety for them and their children. Um, the shelter works together real well, and we've had a wonderful um, uh, a cooperative spirit with our staff uh, being able to, and with clients, to be able to do all the things that we need to do for COVID-19 and the CDC precautions and guidelines. Um, we are just really, really fortunate in that. Um, when um, clients come in, we ask them just, you know, we explain to them when we clear them that we will be following the CDC guidelines of the safer from home policy from the governor. And then they understand that going in, coming into the shelter. And then once they come in, we uh, provide them with masks if they don't have those and their children if they're uh, seven years old or older, which is in Alabama, that's the law uh, or the guidelines. And then we um, provide for them clean clothes. Uh, and then we ask them to take a shower immediately and provide them with, you know, bed linens and all the things that they need for their rooms. Uh, each client is in uh, a bedroom, each person, each family is in a bedroom, and then we provide them with brand new toys and things like that for their children in their rooms uh, so that they will be, you know, occupied and have things that they can, um, you know, do while they're in their rooms. We also provide activities for them every afternoon and evening um, that they can do in their rooms or they can come to the TV room or go outside. Luckily, today's a beautiful day, so they'll get to take advantage of our playground and play uh, yard um, and be able to spend some time outside, which is really nice because the weather's been so bad. Um, but then our kitchen staff has been wonderful to be able to do what they need to do for the protocols. Uh, they We serve now in the styrofoam boxes that y'all probably see carry out, and each um, uh, room has a you know, each however many family members are in that room would get the styrofoam boxes for their lunch and dinner, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And uh, we have ice buckets that they use that we will change out. Uh, everything's sprayed and cleaned after each uh, use, like the trays that they're served on, the roller trays and all of that, um, which is, you know, very demanding on our, um, you know, our staff, but they're more than willing to help and do whatever they need to do. Um, so we also have our children's program that's been also wonderful. Um, they uh, just recently, just while, while I was leaving to come here, we were offering a parenting class that we were offering on Zoom and we just said we're going for it. So we were able to social distance that uh, the ladies to come you know, from their rooms to the to this area that they could social distance and the parenting instructor came in and that was wonderful. That ladies were you could just, you know, my office is kind of next door and you can hear the, you know, the laughter and all of the things about being able to be together and be among each other and the support they felt. So that was a wonderful experience. We do offer three groups a week. Um, I have a, I have a several graduate students and uh, I supervise in social work. And so we'll make sure that they are doing groups with the ladies so they feel interactive that way. And then we also run a regular support group that one of our outreach counselors run every week. So, um, you know, that's just a good overview of what's happening at the shelter and how we're trying to meet the needs of the clients as well as the needs of the children and also the staff is being protected and the clients are being protected from COVID-19. Been very successful. Thank you for all you do. You're, you're welcome. Is there any questions? Y'all have questions that you wanna ask? Um, there, there were a few questions in the, ch in the chat room. Okay. Do you provide any training for police departments regarding domestic violence? Yes, we do. It's actually, the victim advocate court supervisor and my outreach counselor at a law enforcement training today. Um, that was kind of put on the shelf like everything else during COVID-19, but that's been started by a uh, police officer required to have 40 hours of training from they call APOST, which is Alabama um, Certification Program. And so the Mobile County uh, Sheriff's Department, as well as the Mobile Police Department. And then we go to the surrounding uh, counties and areas. And I used to be involved in all of that training, but now I've kind of delegated that to my outreach um, person. So they're both there today doing Mobile City Police as well as the Sheriff's Department. So we are doing lots of training with them. So you, you do outreach training for the police. You do outreach training really for children in schools. 
Are there any other groups that you, you target to do some training? All professional, any, well, anybody really, when I first hired, I, uh, I see Catherine on the, uh, on the, um, on the zoom, uh, I was the outreach person. I developed the outreach program and Catherine sent me to every garden club and women's club that was in Mobile. I can tell you where all of those are. And, uh, and that's how we really got started on our outreach program, just serving, you know, people that might just be in the community that had no idea about domestic violence, but and maybe we're in a domestic violence situation. So um, that's kind of how it got started. So yeah, we do anybody and everybody that are willing to come or that want us to come and are willing to listen to us. Um, the, another question was, it was mentioned that there were a total of five such safety havens in the United States. Where are the other four? I know Jacksonville, Florida was one. Safe Horizon in New York was the other. And those are the top three that I know of. I'm not sure about the fourth because we were the fifth. And, and the third question is, are Penelope House hats available for purchase? <laughs> and mm -hmm. we could yes, uh, they are. On wear the them on the website. People, it is on the Penelope House website? Yes. OK. Those are the three questions that I Great. found. Great. It's so nice to see y'all. So good to see you. Thank you for joining. Okay, so, all right, so we'll go to the next slide. Okay. So I'm making you jump around, Eleanor. <laughs> okay, so, um, so that one was just to kind of follow up with the Peaceful North Begins at Home and then also the, um, the houses that we were using for the domestic violence awareness. Um, but, you know, one of the programs I also wanted to, um, to, to um, talk to you a little bit about was our transitional living program. And with that program, we have uh, apartments that are scattered in the community. But um, Jenny Pappas is the um, coordinator for our transitional living program, who also was in the local chapter of the Daughters of Penelope. And she actually popped in too. So I'm gonna let her talk to you a little bit about transitional living. Well, good morning. Uh, this was a, a surprise, but um, I am the program coordinator for the transitional housing program. And our transitional housing program currently consists of seven apartments in the, in the local community. These apartments are for clients who are homeless as a result of the domestic violence and have barriers that prevent them from going any further with, in terms of getting housing when they leave the shelter. So some of these barriers might be their income, it might be their um, education, uh, it may be some legal matters that have to be resolved before they can really go any further with their, um, to become independent and self-sufficient. Um, what else? Um, provide the transportation. Uh, we we can provide care. transportation for clients that don't have transportation. We can provide child care uh, on a limited basis. Um, we, um, yeah. we encourage our clients to increase their income or their employment uh, opportunities by either, you know, taking some sort of training or um, perhaps uh, finishing a degree that they've started. I've had clients that come to me and they don't have their high school diploma, they need their GED. I've had clients that come to me that are two or three credits or courses short of getting their master's degree. Um, and so we can provide, you know, some, housing for them while they take care of those things. Um, that's about what we're doing right now. We also provide support group or we were providing support group. We're trying to get back into that right now. Right now what I'm doing is I'm putting together packets of information that normally we would be providing for them um, like on a weekly basis, having them read it over, give me some feedback. Um, we're doing some of our uh, sessions by phone. Some of the clients are coming in. It just depends on uh, what they're doing. Most of my clients are out in the community, they're working. And so we're trying to limit some of the COVID exposure, but, um, but I am definitely in touch with them each week and, and seeing if they need anything. If they need referral to an agency, um, their food stamps, whatever that might be. Great. Thank right. you so much. 
It's, it's a good transition from, from being in a shelter that's so structured and, and so many rules they feel that they're following and all that. So this is like the like a, a nice step away from the shelter where there's still structure. They still have the support of a case manager to make sure that they're linked with all the resources they need. I mean, she had a lady um, who was in med school at one point. Mm -hmm. And so she was able to go into a program. It's a two-year program. So you can be in that to clean up credit, to finish those educational goals and do those all the kind of things. So that way, when you leave there, you're less likely to be working poor or, or something like that. So it's a really, a really great program that we've had challenges on um, as far as funding. Um, different funding sources have done different things. And um, transitional living has, um, is one of the most successful models in dealing with any kind of homelessness. Um, because it's not from have not to have so quickly that you've got some transition there where you can learn skills, budgeting skills, all those kind of things that you need. And unfortunately, in some of the federal grants, um, they don't see it that way. And so one of the things I want to bring up also that, that, that we're very involved with is Andrew Kefis with, with, with the liaison as our um, lobbyist right, for the DOP lobbyists in DC, because Andrew's looking at all kind of federal policies and laws and legislation, how do they affect us at the grass level? And so when he's looking at things at the macro level, at that big level, we can give him stats, we can give him stories, we can give him situations of how all those things impact victims at, on a day-to-day -day life kind of thing. And, and actually, you know, with the daughters, you know, there's that civic responsibility that's part of our mission as well. And, and there's a, a big problem that, that is going on in DC right now. And that's one of the things that I'm hoping that our sisters will, will heads up, be listening for when Andrew starts sending out some, some things for us to reach out to, to our legislators, our elected officials about, and it's called the VOCA Fix. Uh, the Victims of Crime Act supports a lot of programs that helps victims of any kind of crime. But this past year, we had a almost a uh, almost a two hundred thousand dollar reduction in that major grant that covers shelter and our court advocacy program and transitional living. And if that VOCA fix doesn't happen this year, there'll be additional cuts. So, um, and that won't just affect Penelope House, that will affect every domestic violence shelter throughout the nation. It'll affect, affect um, people who do sexual assault work, um, all the, vic the crime victim fund that helps reimburse victims of crime for different situations. So like I said, if I could appeal to everyone to be on the lookout and, and really read up on it, understand it and, and follow Andrew's lead, which is also our grand president's lead as far as you know, things that we need to do to, to empower women and, and, and make sure that they get the services that they need. Um, so that, that was my little, my little plug for that. And Tony, um, we have a few more questions if we can take them. Okay. Very, uh, very informative, very helpful. Um, on average, how long do the, do the uh, residents stay at Penelope House? How long you know, it, it varies because like I mentioned before with the perpetrators that destroy your purses, um, if you come to Penelope House and you were born in Texas, then we have to get your birth certificate from Texas. And after 9-11, they made all those kind of documents a little more challenging to get. So we may have somebody who's with us for three weeks waiting to get the documents that they need so they can apply for a job and apply for, I mean, you can't even get a, um, a protection from abuse order unless you have um, um, an ID, a picture ID. So you've got to recreate all those documents that you need. So that person may be with us a lot longer. Um, some people come in, they have all their ducks in a row. They've got all their finances straight. They came here just to be safe. And the next morning they get on the plane and they're out of here. Um, there's some people who can do it that quickly. And then there's another population that, that we don't talk about very often. And it's like the mail order brides. You know, legally, they bring brides here from South America, India, Russia, you name it. And once they're here, their husband no longer is doing the things that they were supposed to do. And they don't do immigration paperwork and things like that. And then they have a child and then they're almost trapped here and they're threatened with being deported. So clients 
in that situation, they stay with us quite a bit because there's so many immigration issues that have to be um, dealt with. And we have an immigration attorney pro bono who works with our clients um, to help. Mm -hmm. And how about um, any particular medical organizations or primary care, specialty care, what kind of healthcare services are available um, for the victims? Yeah, we were, we were actually the very first um, domestic violence shelter um, in the nation to actually have a medical clinic on site. So we have a partnership with the University of South Alabama with a family, family practice where they would send residents here once a week where, where we train them in domestic violence and then they see our clients for free. Uh, with COVID, all of that kind of went away and they offered telehealth, but a lot of our clients have not liked the telehealth kind of thing. So we work with many, um, you know, health departments. We work with many entities within the city to, um, to make sure that they're linked up not only with medical care, but also with mental health services. And one of our local hospitals, which is a, um, Ascension Health Hospital, um, they assist all of our clients with their medications at no cost. Yeah, very good, very good. Just one more question. How long does it take for a family to move to transitional housing or transitional living? Um, they have to be within the shelter for, for two weeks? For or 28 days, 20, 21 days. Yeah. 21 days, they'll have to be in shelter first. And a lot of that is just to kind of get all your ducks in a row and, and figure out what size apartment she has available versus will the family fit that size kind of thing. But the transitional living itself is a two year program. And then hopefully they're launched a permanent housing that, that, that is violence free. Okay. Tony Ann, there, there are three more, uh, two more questions. Okay. Or three more questions now. How does it look for getting federal funding? Did the Penelope House receive stimulus money? Oh, that's a good one. Um, what we did receive <laughs> is the, um, the payroll protection plan. And, and thank God for that, because that allowed us to pay all of our employees that are not on a grant. So that totally, totally was the, the best thing that ever happened because that, that truly financially helped tremendously. You know, sadly with a lot of the, the, the CARES Act money, a lot of the COVID related money, the federal government released it to the states. And then the states kind of panicked, especially Alabama, because they were scared to give out that funds because the, the feds didn't give them clear guidelines on how it should be spent. And so they were nervous about giving it to you to spend because if you spend it wrong, then we would have to pay the feds back. So that money, although we've been approved for several pots of COVID money, it hasn't flowed down at all, at all. And I will take this, I'll take, I'm gonna take this, point to, 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 to bring up something too, because 2020 was definitely a difficult year. We couldn't do our fundraisers. We did a minor one, but it didn't make a lot of money. Um, businesses weren't able to give like they normally give. Churches weren't able to give like they normally give because, well, we all know what's going on with COVID. A lot of individuals stepped up because I think a lot of people felt that if I haven't been impacted as greatly as others, then I, I need to help. And we're very thankful for those people that are generous. But I've got to tell you, once again, someone from the Daughters of Penelope saved Penelope House. Um, Barbara Kazizis, who passed away, unbeknownst to us, she left us, um, you know, um, from stocks and bonds and things like that. And next, you know, we get phone calls and, and all of a sudden we're receiving a check. And so, you know, individuals, truly do make a difference. So whether it's the small things you do or the large things you do, believe me, we are totally 100% grateful, but I think any nonprofit that you support truly is grateful. I'm sorry, I kind of got steered off on that. That's, that's okay, that's, that was wonderful. And, and God rest her soul and God bless her, her, her uh, generous yeah. spirit yes. that, that, that did that. The next question is, um, she uh, sister's in Michigan and wants to know the closest place for someone who is in need. How would you go about looking for? Yeah, help? Every, every state has like, like, Al, like we have our Alabama Coalition Against Domestic Violence. So you can always call the state coalition and they know of every shelter within your state. And then you can ask them which one is closest to whatever area. There's also a 1-800, um, I don't have it around me. 
um, at 1-800-NATIONAL-DOMESTIC-VIOLENCE-HOTLINE. That could also connect you. But my guess is if you went to the state coalition first, because they, they know, they know what's happening within their state. The third question is how many residents are in the shelter currently and how many children are there? And are there opportunities for our youth here in California to help the children sending cheery cards? What are their needs? Um, you know, I don't have my census from this morning. Will you grab that? Okay. Um, I'll get, Jenny's gonna grab it for me and I'll tell you exactly how many. But the way, the way people can help, if you wanted to help our children here, is um, a lot of times people will send money and they'll earmark for children. Because a lot of times, like with MLK coming up, our staff right now was looking for what kind of cool projects can they do to talk about who he was, what was his message, you know, peace and love. And I mean, so every holiday, we're always trying to do something creative. Um, we want the children to, when they leave the shelter, to remember, I got this awesome fire truck, not why they came to us. So, you know, you're sometimes like if you're in California, the shipping to get something here is, you know, is a lot of money. So sometimes it might be better just to send the check. And then if you, you know, and I can always email you or write you and let you know how we spent it. Um, I do that a lot because I think you feel, you feel like your, 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 your donation did make a difference. And, and even if it was to help with the child's birthday party kind of thing, it, it still feels good for everyone. Um, why, why don't we hear from the founder on how it all started, if she unmutes herself, <laughs> and about her first clients. I think everybody would be surprised who your first clients were. There she is. Are you talking to me? Of course I'm talking <laughs> to you. She okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so our first client. Actually, oh, the first client was a man. <laughs> he came knocking at our door saying that he had been stabbed with a knife, a kitchen knife. And so we gave him some information and sent him, he was just lived two doors down. <laughs> so we, we tried to help him out. Um, our first real client uh, resident was from Washington County, which is a county that we continue to serve. Um, they were brought in by the uh, sheriff and um, we took them in and were able to serve her and her children. Um, it, it's been a long journey and uh, we've you know, served thousands and thousands of people over the years. I just have to say, I'm so proud of Tony Ann for the work that she's done and how well she's developed our programs. Well, it, and, okay. you know, of course the daughters, we could never have done this without daughters. You've always been our backbone, always been our angels. And we appreciate that so much. Anything else you, I can say? Did you play your games today? <laughs> what, I what, did. Okay. I did. I have to go on that. <laughs> I was going to say, and this is mom's mom's neighbor. Um, she shares the office next door to her. This is Deidre. Deidre is our grant writer. Um, when, when I say our budget is over $2 million, about 60% of that budget is based on grants. And so Deidre is the one who's writing the grants um, to try to bring in as many federal dollars and foundation money and even IHEPA money that we can. So, so she's the, the brains behind all of, the, all of those grants. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, another question is, what are the current needs um, do you have that the Daughters of Penelope may be able to assist you with? Our current needs probably, you know, it's amazing um, how much of, think about how much you clean at home with all the COVID precautions and everything else, the Lysol sprays, the Clorox wipes. Um, we are going through those kind of supplies like mad. 
Um, and again, the federal dollars haven't trickled down to help cover those costs. So whether it's, um, you know, like I said, it's back to sometimes it's easier if you just sent, even if it was $10, it's easier just to send money where we can go buy those kind of cleaning products. Because if you send us Clorox wipes, you're going to spend so much money on the, the postage or whatever to get it here. So our, our main focus right now is making sure we stay ahead of the curve and have plenty of the mask and plenty of everything that we need. And then when a client gets here, they basically are given a goodie basket for their room that's full of the wipes and the mask and everything else. So they can constantly do what they're supposed to do within their room and within their realm. Um, you know, I think that's that's been our, our biggest thing right now. And I'll be honest with you, we have written some pretty serious grants and we just don't know if they're gonna come through because my biggest thing was the way we are sheltering clients, one family unit in a spot, we have to expand our shelter because we're gonna to have to continue this as best practices beyond everyone has a vaccine and we feel safe. So we've written a, a, a triple digit massive grant for um, the developer who actually built the shelter he gave me numbers that we could put together and, and with some of the, the most of the, the COVID money, it's either a response to it, it's dealing with it, those kind of things. So this would be one of those in response to expanding the shelter. So we are in just so much uncertainty right now because if, if we get a call tomorrow that, oh my gosh, you've gotten this million dollar grant that's covering expansion of the shelter and then in the air vents, I don't know if y'all have seen that, it's to help with circulation where it um, it cleans the air kind of stuff. So, so in the communal living, that's so important. And also expanding the shelter, if, if it, it's built like in a U and one side is the client halls, the other side is where court advocates are stationed. Um, we're gonna build that side of the U out also because we need offices um, for our staff so they're not sharing and they're sharing phones and stuff like that. And also we need meeting rooms so when law enforcement comes to take, um, is gonna sign a warrant and needs to meet with the client that, that they're not in a small office, that they're in a bigger area where they can social distance and not always use our boardroom, which is used for support group and everything else. We can't kind of wait your turn. We need more areas to, when DHR comes to interview a family about their home incident, they need that kind of, so I mean, it's hard to say what we need right now because we don't know really what we're going to get from above yet. But the needs that we know are what do you need to take care of your clients and make them comfortable and happy? And those are things, like I said, that, that we go to Walmart and buy new pajamas and buy a sweatshirt or buy a new coat because Penelope's Closet didn't have the size that they needed and when they need a coat, you know, those kind of things. They're more immediate needs that grants usually don't cover anyway. And I did get the, um, the census right now is 18 in shelter, um, six, uh, six women and 12 children. Tony, and another question is, can you, we send things directly to the facility through Amazon or maybe um, um, Bed Bath & Beyond? Is there like a wish list? Like, are you registered in any way? Um, you know, we're registered in several places. I don't know. I'm gonna make myself a note and check on that. I know we have Amazon Smile. So whenever you're shopping for, um, and Daughters has that too. Whenever you're shopping on Amazon, you can pick a charity you wanna support. Um, and so it gives like a percentage of whatever your sales are kind of thing. But that that's, a you know, I can look at seeing if we actually have certain things registered. I know we had done that with one place, but I can't remember who it is to be honest, but I'll look and see. Do, do you supply when, when, when your clients are ready to go out onto their own and establish their own homes, do you supply like household items and things yeah. like that to help they, them? They out? get what we call a, a goodbye bucket and it's a bucket. And um, if we have mops, we'll give them mops too, but usually it's the bucket and it's got like um, your typical household cleaners and, and things that they, when they get there that they don't have to go out and buy. So a lot of our donations, um, we can recycle that way. And, and we do that quite a bit, but you know, Penelope's Closet um, and that address, I can tell you it's 2907 Old Chill Road, but we'll have that and it's on our website. A lot of people will send things there um, just because we don't have a lot of storage at the shelter. So anything that's at the closet, our clients get for free. So whenever they're leaving, if they need 
a small microwave, then the case manager will call the closet and say, hey, do you have a small microwave? You do, great, hold that. And then, you know, like I said, we've got paperwork the client takes and fills out and, um, and gets it met that way. Another, another sister asked, can we do kits with basic needs? You know, like when we, um, at conventions, when we gather up all the shampoos and, and, mm -hmm. and you know, everything that, that's in the, in the bathrooms, can they put together like a, a, a kit? Is there, or is there a list of things that can be in a kit that we can send down kits? Um, we, we do, and a lot of local people will do that because that is an easy thing to do and you can kind of um, do assembly line with it. And, and usually it's um, female products, feminine products, um, deodorant, um, toothbrush, toothpaste, pillowcases. You know, we are going through pillows and pillowcases like mad because um, we tell them, take it. When you leave, take it. You know, those are the things that we don't want to share and possibly spread not only COVID, but lice or something, whatever someone may have. So it's always, you know, you take those things. So we're constantly having to replenish your basic needs kind of stuff. Um, Sister Tony, um, do you all provide a haven for women who may be the victims of humic trafficking? No, we don't. That um, Our mission is straight for intimate partner violence. When we get calls for anything that's not quite within our mission, um, we have a list of all the community resources. So there is actually a shelter that's less than an hour from where we are. Um, so we really don't get a lot of calls on that simply because there's another resource for that and law enforcement is well aware of it. Um, another sister asked if we can donate directly online. Do you have a donate? Yeah, we have on our um, website, it's penelopehouse.org. Um, we've got PayPal and we've got a, a donation button kind of thing. And on there, we usually will put on our website, we usually will put like um, the hats that are for sale, a link for that. Um, at Christmas, some of the kids with the staff had made some canvases that we kind of auctioned off. You know, that was on there as well. So the website will usually have any of those kind of promotional things that we have going on. When we sold our mask, um, we had that on there as well. And our Facebook page um, usually will we'll have those kind of information on there and we'll, we'll push you to our website to, for donations. Kathy, I think you have another question. Helen McClure's. Um, was, um, there was, uh, with COVID perpetuating the uptick in domestic violence, has Penelope House been able to meet the need? Okay, so, you know, I think there was a national narrative that kind of went with that. But um, in the very beginning in March, um, our census, as soon as the COVID hit and everyone, no one knew what it was. Everyone totally freaked out, everybody. And that includes criminals. Um, I get a, a crime report every day of what's happening, you know, what overnight recap, that kind of stuff. There was like no crime in the city of Mobile except for like um, theft of property. I mean, there was no, violent crimes at all for probably the first two or three weeks after the pandemic hit. And, and, and our census was low, our crisis calls were low. There's two sides of that coin, but one side of that coin is at Thanksgiving, our census is always low because abuse is a choice and perpetrators don't abuse when they want something or need something. So at Thanksgiving, they want the turkey cooked, they want the dressing made, they want things to be nice they don't abuse at that time. Most abusers don't abuse at that time because they want those things to happen. So that mentality kind of existed at the beginning of COVID as well. On the flip side, there were victims who were, who were at home and isolated and not able to reach out. So no, that's very valid that that was a possibility, but our, our numbers who were in shelter, our number of crisis calls, everything was low in the month of, a month of March and even into April. So until the community started lifting the curfews and things like that, when restaurants started back opening, when businesses started back up, then your numbers started to climb again. But at that beginning stages, we truly, and our numbers at the end of this year are gonna reflect it totally. Last year, we sheltered over um, 800. And I think this year, the number is gonna be like, I don't know, I'm, we don't, I don't have my total numbers yet, but I think that um, it's probably going to be, gosh, I don't know, maybe over 500. It's not going to be over 800. 
so like I said, that that's kind of the trend that we've seen at our shelter and other shelters in the state of Alabama have and talking with our counterparts like um, on the Gulf Coast in Mississippi and the Gulf Coast in Florida, um, they've seen similar things as well. I think there was a national narrative out there about skyrocket numbers, skyrocket this, and, and that's fine because that generated funding and things like that. And it did happen as soon as things were opened up. But like I said, I think in the beginning from, from what I saw here is I think everyone freaked out, including the perpetrators. Good food for thought. <laughs> yeah. I think we've I think we've brought forth all of the questions. What do you think, Sister Kathy? I think so. From what I can see, too, I, I don't think I think we've answered uh, all that we've received so far. Uh -huh. And and I'll, I'll add a, one more little thing with the COVID as well is that. Um, you know, when when cities and things like that were on curfew, you know, our staff were considered essential services. So we all had letters that they kept in their car. So that someone who works from 11 to, to 8 in the morning, they had that in their car. So if they were stopped by law enforcement, they would say, I'm going to work. I'm, I work at Penelope House. Um, we had no problem with that. And then also, when um, our health department had has vaccines, they the the doctor from the health department called me and said, "Hey, are there any of your staff who would like to be vaccinated?" And so I kind of did a poll with staff, and we've gotten, you know, several of us have gotten the first round, and because they see us as essential workers, and and they understand the the level of importance of the work, and like I said, clients are in and out, in and out, so we're exposed to, uh, you know, no telling really, but um. So that was just a, a, a thing that, that really was a nice perk that I could offer my staff as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, somebody asked, how many residents can you house at any given time? Well, like I said, we, we, we never turn anyone away because it, the time that you say there's no room in the inn, it could be a homicide that night. So what we have done, even with, like, like I said, because COVID we're limited with how many are in a household, we've had to close down our TV room and put a family in the TV room. We've even closed our playroom down and done that. We've actually um, housed people in the alternate settings as well. So we we don't like to utilize um, hotels, but certainly um, someone is much safer in a hotel than staying in that position, you know, where they are. Well, this has been the fastest hour that I've ever <laughs> experienced in my life. I can't believe um, time flew so quickly. And I appreciate so much, not only you taking the time to present Penelope House to us and for Catherine being on, but for all the work that you do 365 days a year, 24 seven. I've had the honor of visiting Penelope House on several occasions and it is just a phenomenal experience and I'm in awe of you on a daily basis. Um, any final thoughts before I turn it over to Grand President Celia? Oh, for me? Yeah. Oh, well, I definitely want to echo mom and say thank you for the support of the Daughters of Penelope because, you know, when we write grants, um, they want to make sure that you're a solid organization. You're a good 501c3. You manage your, your funds well, blah, blah, blah. But community support is so important. And every time we do a grant, we have to tell our story. So we're always telling our story about the Daughters of Penelope. And a lot of times that sets us apart from other agencies that are applying for money. And so, like I said, um, A, I think it's great for the Daughters for their name to be out there and what we stand for, but also it's great for us, you know, in funding for us to show stability. Wonderful. Sister Celia? Well, Tony Ann, I want to thank you so much for your presentation today and uh, for introducing us to some of the staff at Penelope House. And of course, uh, Sister Catherine, I mean, you were at the right place at the right time. You had the vision and you saw what needed to be done and you just took it upon yourself to do it. So we thank you for that as well. I am hopeful that the sisters gleaned an insight into the programs. You were so right, Tony Ann, when you said that uh, you can't really give the full picture when you make the presentation at the convention, but I'm sure everybody's heads are swelling right now with all the information that uh, you shared with us today and your experiences. And 
Um, <clears throat> so it is unfortunate that there is a need in our communities for your service. Uh, and you should all be commended for filling that need so professionally and so well, and you give such support um, to, this, to the, the residents that come, adults and children alike. So may God bless you all, and may you be able to continue what you do in your community and spread your knowledge to help others to, to uh, be fulfilling in their lives. So thank you so much for attending today and sharing. Thank you. Elena, our next presentation is when and with whom? And you're on mute. Oh. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks again so much, Tony. And it was so informative. And I think that everyone really can feel the connection to how much is done at Penelope House by you and the staff. So thank you so much again.